Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this, uh, probably one of the first fringes of conference. Uh, my name is Michelle Khan. I am a councillor from Medway. For those of you who don't know, it's just in South East in Kent. Um, this is, event has been put on by SME for Labour, and I mean, the title is, the, the clue is in the title. It's called The Labour Party and Englishness. And tonight, tonight this afternoon, we're going to be exploring. Um, Oh, it's gone very far to me. <laughs> uh, this afternoon we're going to be exploring that re the relationship that Labour Party has with Englishness, what um, our role is, do we have a relationship with Englishness, um, how we are winning in England and um, what we need to do in order to win in England. And we've got, we've got two fantastic guests on this panel who don't need, really need an introduction, but I will be introducing them anyway. Um, <laughs> To my left, I have Gavin Esler, who you will know probably as a broadcaster and journalist. And Gavin presented Newsnight from 2003 to 2014. I have to say this because it is in Kent, but he is now <laughs> Chancellor of the University of Kent, which is a, it's a very important to me. Um, and it's great to have you in this part of the UK. Uh, and Gavin has recently authored a book called How Britain Ends which I have to admit, Gavin, is quite dramatic. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that today. Um, and the book explores the rise of English nationalism and what that means for the UK and what that means for the future of the UK. But I will allow Gavin to talk about that in a bit more detail um, shortly. Uh, there is, and I've been asked to make sure I mention this, that there is a book signing of that same book today. <laughs> um, at two o'clock, just after this, session um, and you can go along to the conference bookshop which I'm told is on the first floor ironically next to the GB stuff. GB News. GB yeah. News <laughs> Sorry. 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 <laughs> so please do make sure that after this event um, you pop along. Um, that's if Gavin hasn't given you all the spoilers already. Um, to my right I am joined by John Denham who of course we will all know as a front bench politician who um, served in a, during a Labour government, which I have to admit seems to have a distant memory now, doesn't it? Um, but it'd be great to hear from you, John, particularly about how we go back to winning, how we go back to winning governments and how we go back to winning in England. And um, John, since you stood down, we've done quite a bit of work on this, since you stood down from frontline politics. Um, so you're also now a fellow of English Identity and Politics at Southampton, which is brilliant. Um, but most importantly, founder of the English and Labour Network, which is leading um, alongside SME for Labour on some of these discussions around our relationship with England, identity, and what that means for the Labour Party. And to give you your plug as well, John, there is an event tomorrow um, at the Old Ship, um, which will be at 12.30, um, looking at how Labour wins in England. So if you're interested and you enjoy today's Fringe, please do come along to that as well. How it's going to work is I'm going to give both our panellists a, a bit of time to talk um, and sort of present their thoughts and ideas, and then I will open up to the floor for questions. So please do have a think um, as we go along about what you might like to ask. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Gavin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very, very pleased to be here at this, uh, where things are obviously going so well in our country. I can't think where <laughs> we would <we're> rather <laughs> be. You know, I, I woke up this morning and I thought, I'm living in a Marx Brothers gag. Uh, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? I think we have to start believing the evidence of our own eyes that possibly this government isn't working very well for anybody. Uh, I hope this conference goes particularly well because we absolutely need an alternative, it seems to me. Um, I, I've always been Scottish and British and European. And I've never really thought much about those different identities. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, Scottish when I watch the rugby matches. Uh, I'm a Londoner when I'm on the tube. Why do people move to the right? I don't understand it. Uh, I live in Kent, and I love living in Kent. I love living in England, and I do so by choice. Um, I'm British when I watch the Olympics. Uh, and I even, when I wrote for the Scotsman newspaper, which I did for a number of years, even when I was working for the BBC, I once dared to suggest that when Scotland aren't playing, I would support the England football team. <laughs> and to say that the reaction to that was mixed, um, I would say it was mixed between those who hated what I said and those who violently hated what I said. <laughs> and in fact, I got one comment which I, I committed to memory, it was lovely, it said, uh, 
I would rather support Satan and all his minions <laughs> gloriously arrayed than any England football team. I'm not proud of this, it's just the way I am. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's not me. But look, I'm, I'm here because I wrote How Britain Ends, which is, is absolutely not a recommendation, uh, it, it, but it is an observation. And the starting point for me, in a way, was the 2015 general election. Because um, uh, and if Ed Miliband had even held on to half the Labour seats in Scotland, we would not be in this mess that we're in now, because we wouldn't have had a Brexit, we would have had a better country. But uh, Labour collapsed in Scotland, went from, I think it was 46 seats at the general election in our antiquated, in my view, first past the post system, to just one seat. And in Edinburgh, my friends used to joke that there are more giant pandas in Edinburgh Zoo than there are no Labour MPs from Scotland at Westminster. But it wasn't a joke. And of course, that election, the tectonic plates of our union began to shift. Uh, they, it happened before. It, was, it didn't just sort of happen overnight, but it was clear. Scotland voted for the SNP as the largest party, indeed, the largest party in Northern Ireland, although they may not be overtaken by Sinn Féin before long. Uh, Labour remained the biggest party in uh, uh, Wales. And in England, uh, the Conservatives were the biggest, biggest party and are the biggest party today. Uh, another interesting factor about that election was that 3.8 million of our fellow citizens voted for UKIP and they got nothing. Well, actually, they got Douglas Carswell, so they got <laughs> next to nothing. Uh, and he quit, so they did get nothing. But almost 4 million of our people not having really a voice in Parliament, however much uh, one is, I am not a fan of UKIP and I don't think anybody in the room is. It did seem to me that things were going really quite seriously wrong and they would continue to go wrong until we actually had to think about the relationship between the different parts of our country and particularly the fact that the first past the post system doesn't operate in elections in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, but it does operate in England. And people in England, including those who voted UKIP, seem to feel, with some justification, that there's a democratic deficit in England. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think England has had a very, very raw deal. And the question is, what we do about it? What do we do about Andy Burnham uh, in, in Manchester, or, or, or actually the Conservative mayor in, uh, in Birmingham, who may feel that they speak with a loud voice for their area, but actually local government has also been bled in England of finance for years, as our chair will, <laughs> will absolutely know. Uh, and how did the, this present government fix it? Well, uh, Boris Johnson, one of the first things he did was he, he, he took the, uh, his new cabinet to Sunderland for one day, and Sajid Javid tweeted, it's great to be here in North England. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a postgraduate in Leeds University, and I tell you, nobody anywhere from Leeds North ever talks about North England. And, <laughs> and I then thought about one of my heroes, a man called Arthur Greenwood, who is not much known these days, but he was the deputy leader of the Labour Party in the 1930s. And in September 1939, when Nazi troops were pulling in, pouring into Poland, and Soviet troops were also pouring into Poland, Arthur stood up in the House of Commons to speak. And when he spoke on the opposition bench, on the government benches, Leo Amory, a right-wing conservative, said, speak for England, Arthur. And Arthur did. He said, we have to go to war against Germany. Appeasement has been a disaster. But Arthur didn't just speak for England. He spoke for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. He spoke for the United Kingdom, and he spoke for, as it, as it was then, the British Empire too. Who is it who speaks for England now credibly, but also speaks for the United Kingdom? It's not Boris Johnson. When I went to Edinburgh Book Festival in 2019, I met a number of, I, I, I'm, I was born in Clyde Bank, uh, as it happens in a council house in Clyde Bank, and I got a scholarship to a school in Edinburgh. And when I went to Edinburgh, which is a very small seat conservative city, uh, in 2019, at Edinburgh Book Festival, a number of my friends said, um, we voted against independence in 2014, but we're thinking of voting for independence now. Partly because of Brexit, but partly because when Boris Johnson says he's a one-nation conservative, that one-nation sounds to us like England. 
And a few months later, in October 2019, I went to Northern Ireland. And uh, I've got family roots there. My family were some of us Protestants, so fundamentally unionists. Uh, and it was about two days after Boris Johnson threw Ulster unionism into the Irish Sea, effectively, 100 years of unionism, by agreeing to the customs border between Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom, which apparently was excellent, according to Lord Frost, but is now excrement, according to Lord Frost. <laughs> very odd, very odd uh, government we have here. Anyway, um, talking to friends, both nationalists and unionists in Northern Ireland, a couple of things struck me. One said, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Thatcher used to say Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Now Northern Ireland in customs terms is as British as France. And now you may not agree or, may agree or disagree, but that was a sentiment which has fueled some of the dissension over there. And uh, somebody else said to me, uh, the trouble is that with Brexit, and it is as if three people go to a pub, an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, and the Englishman wants to go home, so we all have to leave. <laughs> now, there's a great sense of humour in Northern Ireland, because actually it helps get through things. But the key part of the puzzle is England, because England is 84% of our country. By our country, I mean the United Kingdom. And what England does now, and the question of, uh, of how somehow uh, England can feel I suspect that democracy is working in England itself and by extension how the other parts of the United Kingdom who wish to go different ways may think again. That seems to me to be one of the big issues of the day and I tell you I, I'm not optimistic. I'm certainly not optimistic with this government. And just a final thought and I'll uh, uh, hand back to the chair. Um, when How Britain Ends was published, uh, a number of uh, prominent conservatives in Scotland got in touch with me, two of whom are household names in Scotland. And independently, these two people, I said to them, what would save the union of the United Kingdom? And they both said, a Labour government. <laughs> now, they're not saying this publicly. And what they also said was, you have to understand that when Boris Johnson visits Scotland, the SNP protests that inwardly they are delighted because he's not Arthur Greenwood. He does not speak for the United Kingdom. And we in the Conservative Party, are, we die inwardly because we know he helps the nationalist case. So my final thought is, if the Union of the United Kingdom does end, there will be profound consequences for England. It's not as if, oh, we get rid of these people, they cost us a lot of money. Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, as some, some people argue. There will be a border between, I suspect, England and a member of the European Union, Scotland. That will be difficult. It's not gone very well in Northern Ireland. There will be implications for defence, there will be implications for nuclear weapons, and there will also be a sense um, that England is rather like the England of Tudor times, where successive monarchs were very, very worried that they're surrounded by a empire or a group of people or religion, Catholicism, which is inimicable to their interests. So England has to play a part. And I'd be really interested if there is somebody who can do the Arthur Green job now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin, and there's some really interesting points there, and hopefully it's given our audience um, some food for thought, uh, and I hope you've got plenty of questions to ask us when we move to that part. Uh, and just as a councillor who represents a part of the South East where I, I can see some of the challenges that you've talked about, a lot of what you said really does ring true. I mean, we had UKIP very close to winning in Medway, um, and actually we did um, have that famous Rochester Street by-election, which was won by Mark Reckless at the time. Um, so we faced off a slice of those challenges, and I think really understand some of those communities that you're talking about, and that sense of being left behind that you've referred to there. So really some really interesting comments, thank you. Um, could I have a team up, please, John? Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Sharon. Thanks very much, Gareth. Um, really interesting to hear what you had to say. I, I must say that 
it's pleasant to meet you under these circumstances rather than about 25 past 10 when I'm back to our news night. It's quite some really embarrassing cop up for the It would be nice to be back in the days where we were explaining really embarrassing cop ups on our own. But, yeah, so I agree with that. Those, that, that, those times uh, are still, still sticking in my mind. Look, I want to talk, actually, we cover a lot of the same sort of ground, but actually, fortunately, from quite a different angle, so I hope it fits together quite well. I'm going to start by setting out three problems, explain where those problems come from, and perhaps what we do about it. So, the first problem, because we're at Labour Conference, is an electoral problem. <coughs> Voters who identify as English, they either say they're more English than British or equally English than British, are the voters who, who the Tories win. In the last election, 70% of the people who said they're more English than uh, British voted Conservative, 20% voted Labour. We actually won that election amongst people who have said they were more British than English, but they're a minority of the population. And we don't win unless we win the votes of people who in part, and sometimes to a considerable extent, say they are English. So that's the first uh, thing we have to take into account. The second thing is that uh, England is the most centralised nation in Europe, separate problem. It's not the most centralised, Britain is not the most centralised nation in Europe, as Piers Darmer's essay said, because Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland have the evolution. This is England that is the most centralised nation in Europe. And we don't have a government. And I don't think we have a bad government, we don't have a government. I mean, if you think of a nation with a geography and a population whose policies for 20 years have been separate from those of Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, ask yourself, where in government is the policy of that nation coordinated? Not in the UK cabinet. That is the UK cabinet of the Union. Come back to that in a moment. There's no civil service committee that coordinates England's policy. There is no minister responsible focusing solely on English domestic policy, and there is clearly no parliamentary accountability let alone in national democracy. So bizarrely, we might be 85% of the union, but we lack the most basic governmental infrastructure of a democratic nation. And there are two serious consequences of that, bizarrely. The first is, Jan's already touched on, it looks to the rest of the union like the union government is an English government telling them what to do. But at the same time, we in England don't have a proper government. So we look at both ways. The way we are governed threatens the union and also denies England proper devolution. One of the reasons why there's no devolution in England is there's actually nothing at the centre to devolve it from, that is coherent. When people say, why is policy not joined up for devolution for local councils, it's because it's not joined up in government either. So we have to change the way that England's government. The third problem for Labour is we won't talk about England. Labour routinely describes England as Britain, although Britain is England, Wales, and Scotland. So prior to the last, the last election, we were promising to rebuild Wales, rebuild Scotland, and, and only in England, rebuild Britain. Now, if you're one of those people whose identity is English, ignoring their identity is the clearest possible way of saying, we are not people like you are. And this is the most visceral relationship in politics. Long before people get to values, ideologies, policies, they say, they look at people and say, can I trust these people to stand up for people like me? And if you wave a great big flag saying, no, we're not like you at all, you don't get past that on the other issues. So when Labour doesn't mention England or talk about the English, the implication is we are not like you. And the example I would give, because I do, I'm English and I'm British, but I would probably be one of the people who said more English than British. Right? When I talk about the English, I talk about we and us. I have been in countless Labour Party meetings where the English are talked about as they and them. And people pick up on this. You know, they notice it. And they say, well, if that's how you feel about us, particularly if we're feeling a bit pissed off at the moment about various grievances, you don't understand us. So we have to talk about England. But quickly, how did we come to be here? Um, it's a curious combination. The people who have led the real damage are not English nationalists, but British nationalists. Boris Johnson is a British nationalist. Michael Farage is a British nationalist. But they have been able to <coughs> mobilize English grievances on their cause. And actually, I'm afraid, partly because Labour refused to address those issues, they mobilized their sense of English interests. And it's British nationalism, particularly a very English form of it, that's now undermining the Union and giving England such a bad government. 
See, the union always rested on the different bits of it having a different view of it. If we are honest, if we are English, we didn't bother very much about what the union was about because it was sort of like greater England. You know, parliamentary sovereignty, well, that's our institution, really. And it's not just Enoch Powell who said that, Michael Foote said it, and I used to hear Tony Benn say it when I first came to conference in the 1970s. It's a very English view about how we operate. If you were Scots, no, you're a separate nation within a union, but you had your own legal system, your own identity, your cultural thing. In Northern Ireland, at least with one part of the population, the union was what guaranteed everything from the button of the boy onwards. And if you're Welsh, well, I think very recently for Wales, read England, took it and absorbed by Henry VIII. But Welshness was kept alive through the church and through language and then through the devolution movement. The union only works if you have got those different ways of looking at why people are in it. And that is what has been lost because we, it, it sort of worked because there was a common purpose. First, it was empire. Empire kept, held the union together. There would have been no union without empire, no empire without union. And then there was the post-war Atlee state, which was a unified British state. But that began to unravel in the 1960s with the first Scottish nationalist wins, the rise of the Welsh language movement, the unravelling of what is an unresolved colonial situation in Northern Ireland. So we have been moving away from this idea that we are a single nation called Britain or the United Kingdom for a very long time. And even British politics, the idea that politics is basically contested by the same parties on the same issues in every part of Britain has been dead for 15 years. 2005 was the last time that a single party won in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. The last three elections, the general elections in each nation have been fought by different parties on different issues and different parties have won. So, I want the union to continue, or a union to continue, though I never talk about saving it because I'm looking at a union for the 21st century, but it needs a new purpose and a new form. And one of the problems we've got at the moment, which Gavin alluded to, we have a union government which is elected almost entirely in England. Its majority of 80 depends on its English majority of 150. And that enables the Johnson government to project this incredibly Anglo-centric British nationalism where that joke was not wrong. England's view is what is best for the Union is what is best for the Union. You see it in the Northern Ireland Protocol with all that lies there, within something called the Internal Market Bill, in which basically the, the, the rights of the devolved nations were pushed to, uh, to push to one side. Well, how were they able to do this? Well, they were able to do this by mobilising real grievances amongst a section of the population who identify as English. As I said, we didn't used to worry about it too much. If you're English, though, you're probably proud of being an English, you almost certainly have a strong relationship with a particular part of England. About 20 years ago, 2001 election, it didn't make any difference whether you were more English, more British, or whatever the way you voted in the 2001 election. Since then, we've had this massive polarisation. Several factors came together. Devolution, if they are them, who are we? Economic change, particularly in working class England, globalisation brought havoc not just jobs, but a whole way of life, the whole purposes of communities. Where, so if you're English in those places, what, and you used to, in a sense, to be right at the heart of the, of the union of manufacturing, and what was your purpose now? Immigration, it brought a new layer of economic change in the labour market and impact on a sense of settled belonging. And Europe, like it or not, because I was a Remainer, did offend people's strong sense of sovereignty and the idea that we should take decisions democratically here. And those voters, and particularly working class voters, left Labour because we didn't speak about the change. We talked about skills, skills and tax credits, not about the lost jobs. We were increasingly seen, and I'm afraid it's true, as a voice of cities and not of towns and smaller communities. And hence the potency of Brexit. It brought together national sovereignty with that idea of controlling immigration policy. So we missed those opportunities. Now, and by the way, on immigration, I increasingly think the more I look back on it, well, our problem was not the original decision, which was actually a mistake, but nobody knew it at the time. It was the fact there was never a Merkel moment. There was never that moment that Angela Merkel gave in 2015 with the Syrian refugees, where she said, hey, no one's expecting this, but we can do it. And our problem, if you're 2005, 2006, we had said, we would expect this, but come on, you know, we can do it, we can make this work. Because if you look around the country, we have made it work. 
you know, I come from a city that's had a huge impact on migration of the AA country. It's worked, it's done now, it's worked, it's all part of this, you know, those tensions aren't there. People made it work. And if we'd had a local moment, anyway, going off on <laughs> <laughs> But of course, the problem we're in now, I'm coming to again, is those English voters voting for Johnsonian Anglo-centric nationalism. And I don't think they've rescinded the principle of Brexit, so don't get your hopes up for Brexit in that round anytime soon. But it is not delivering what they hoped the Brexit would come for. It is not delivering to leveling up. It's delivered elite corruption on a scale which is astonishing. Uh, for me, it's been in democratic politics, first conference I came to was 1976. I have never known something like the PPE cat scandal, the relationships with property developers, the Russian money flooding into the Tory party, all the rest of it, the setting aside of the courts, the attacks on the judi judiciary, and at the grassroots level, no sign of the leveling up. No sign of the sort of investment that would make a difference. The people who said, well, perhaps we'll get the jobs back if we have this big change. It's not English nationalism. Nationalism, like Scottish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, Catalan nationalism, they have political parties, they have public intellectuals, they have social movements, they have civic organisations. This is just a desire of people who feel English to be listened to. And that's what they said in Brexit. But they will want to be listened to <coughs> now. And I think this is our opportunity. Because what is striking for the people of England is how much better the people of England behaved during the pandemic than the people who govern them. And this is an opportunity to say, it doesn't really matter how many Union Jacks Robert, the late lamented Robert Jenrick has in his office. <laughs> the people who are ripping off the country, the people who stand by why industries are sold, uh, the people who will give property developers all these favours, who will do the PPE contracts, these are not patriots. These are not people who are standing up for the people of this country. So we have an opportunity for a sort of progressive patriotic policy. Now, on the England question, what do we need to do? I'm very clear, you know, I'm not, never come to this thing and say English identity is the only thing that matters. But for the reasons I said, it's part of the picture. So what should Labour do? Well, firstly, we should frame our politics in the language of progressive patriotism. Actually, a large part of Keir's essay is about that, but he talks only of Britain. We actually need a progressive patriotism, which is for the Union, but also for England and for Wales, where progressive patriotism has given Labour its greatest successes and in Scotland. We need to talk about England, make it clear that Labour will safeguard England's interests as well as those of Wales and Scotland and the Union as a whole. When we get in, untangle the government of England from that of the Union. Have a machinery of government, civil service and ministers that lead for England. Have a union, uh, have English leadership with an English Secretary of State to coordinate our national policy and to be accountable to MPs. Reform the UK Cabinet so that it only has union ministers with union wide responsibilities, defence, trade, and so on, not the Secretary of State for English Health sitting there in a cabinet with no representation from the devolved nations. But yes, let's be pluralist. Have the First Nations and the other parts of the Union in the UK cabinet, whether they're our party or not, because that's the politics that we, that we need, and the Secretary of State for England. Set out a new vision of the Union where we understand, yes, it's a Union, but it is actually a Union of Nations in our head not a union that one nation can dominate that we come to get used to. And let's have objectives for the 21st century, building a post-Brexit economy, zero carbon transition, shared and inclusive prosperity. Devolution within England, these are not conflict, these are not between, people often say to me, John, if you go on about England at the national level, we don't get devolution. We need both, and we won't get either unless we have both. Our own party, uh, so English democracy, well, a majority of people in England, whatever their identity, actually wanted and have wanted for 20 years a proper version of the English Votes for English Laws that uh, Boris Johnson has just abolished. There's a, we missed the trick of not taking that and running it when we brought it in. We should be campaigning to get it back and do it properly ourselves. We should have a party manifesto for England. The best defence against those the thing that Ed Miliband came up against, well, will you be told what to do by an SAP government, is to say we've got a manifesto for England and that is the only thing we will do. We should campaign as Labour in England. Labour in England, not just as UK Labour. And the final point, which I didn't know Gavin was going to say, but I agree with, electoral reform. I've always supported it, but it is increasingly key to me that it is clear to the key to the future of the Union. The Tory dominance of England and the Tory dominance of the Union 
only comes about by first past the post. Right? They would not have that dominance. And if we had electoral reform across the United Kingdom of Westminster, including in England, there wouldn't be a Tory majority. Now, there probably wouldn't be a Labour majority either. And those people I'm sort of brought up in this, I've been electoral for 40 years, who think politics is all about first past the post, have got to change their views. Politics is about being democratic and then working in a pluralistic way to make things work. So if we had electoral reform, again, that's suggested, then we would have a much better chance of a union for the 21st century and a different style of politics as well. Thank you, John. That was really powerful and insightful, and you know, as usual, you've just really got on the, the skin of this issue. I think you've actually written the manifesto there already, <laughs> so we're good to go. We just need the leadership to sign up to it now. Um, uh, and for what it's worth, I mean, I know we're not here to hear from me today, but um, I think there's some really interesting things there. I think um, we have a challenge as a Labour Party in getting people to really believe in us, in how we sort of view patriotism, but also how we look at identity um, and you know, how we relate to England. And I think one of the problems we have is that we often overthink these things and tend to write you know, several policy papers. And actually it's about being believable or you know, we create a mug that has a line on immigration. That's not what's going to cut through to the public. Um, and that's not what's going to make people believe us when we say we care about England and we care um, about this country and we, we share their values and their, their views. Um, but that's enough for me. Thank you both very much. That was very, very insightful. Uh, I'm sure and I hope that the audience has got plenty of questions. If you could put your hands up, please. There is a roving mic and I will take them in rounds of three. Thank you. We've got about 20 minutes for this section. So I will take a uh, load of front. I will take the gentleman there with his hand up. Um, I'm going to say with a green wristband on then. And I will take uh, the gentleman at the door as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I, I stumbled in here by accident because as soon as I was told that you're cheering, I'm like, yeah, I need to go. Without Kate, you know. <laughs> but, Thank you so much, both of you. You've spoken really well. Um, what I wanted to say, I'll ask you is, we cannot wait until we win the election. We need to act now. Mm. What are the specific, measurable, achievable, realistic thing that we can do now to, you know, for community power? Because when we look at our high streets, we're talking about small, medium, you know, businesses. When we look at our high streets, it's all literally collapsed. How can we have this achievable, specific and measurable solutions that we can use now? Doesn't matter whether those small businesses are, are Labour Party members or not. What we need to do, we need to do something now to support them. And when they see as Labour people, as Labour members, that we are actually not even thinking about the party they belong to or what actually we just want to get members into into our you know into our party, they will definitely come on board and basically be part of our party anyway. But we need something now. We cannot wait until we get into power. So what are those specific things that we can do now for community power? Thank you. Uh, I just really appreciate you articulating lots of thoughts that I've had over many years and providing very clear, concise and persuasive language um, to, to articulate those thoughts. My question is, how do you increase the saliency of an issue which can be brushed off as a niche constitutional change that won't have any material impact on people's lives? <coughs> Uh, thank you, it's very interesting. Is it time for a constitutional convention like the one uh, that took place in Scotland prior to devolution that involves not simply the Labour Party, but it could be led by the Labour Party? The other parties, though probably not the Conservative Party, uh, who I doubt would wish to take part, but uh, the churches, the trade unions, business, community organisations across the country, the Britain, England is broken and it needs fixing and to invite people's ideas on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Gavin, can I come to you first just to briefly comment on 
each yeah. one of those questions that they sent you? Uh, I, I mean, I think we can take them, take them actually together because the one thing we can do now is actually recognise that the myth which is put about by those not in favour of any kind of reform is somehow that England has muddled through for a thousand years and it's all gone very well. <laughs> when we last muddled through in a big way, uh, it was, I suppose, in the lead up to the First World War. And what happened was Ireland left, or 26 counties of Ireland left, in the most brutal fashion. After discussing Home Rule for Ireland for 40 years and a constitutional settlement. So, in brief, don't believe those who say we muddled through. We didn't muddle through in 1603, 1707, 1801 either. We, we had all, all votes for women or a host of other things. We took decisions and we thought about it. And we can do that now. The Labour Party could commit to electoral reform and the Labour Party could commit to a constitutional convention because we absolutely need it. Just final thought on that. When, when the President of the United States had coronavirus, we knew what happened. The Vice President filled in. When our Prime Minister had coronavirus, it was Dominic Raab. Why was it Dominic Raab? What were his powers? Who knew? If you listen to the Today programme, you would hear constitutional experts in our country saying, well, well, uh, well could, he, could he actually declare war on Russia? Well, I don't think he would. <laughs> well, I don't think he would either. But, uh, but what could he do? Why don't we have a simple, simple basic law as we have written one for Germany or many other countries? 70 Linda Colley, the, the historian, says, English lawyers have written constitutions for 70 countries around the world. <coughs> One of those countries isn't us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, over to you. If we could pick up on that, how we people are coming to Yeah, I, one of the critical things, that, one of the things I'm, I'm afraid we find in some of the places where we have lost a Labour vote in the past is that the Labour Party increasingly was not rooted in those communities. <coughs> so it's not just we didn't tap into ideas of identity, but actually part of that gap was the party increasingly came from people from um, one part of town going to places in another part of town mm -hmm. thinking these are the air labour areas and people are going to vote for us. Right? So you do all the stuff I've talked about, cut no ice at all unless we actually build a party with a membership and a presence in the communities where we want to win. So I think yeah. your, your question, I can't have a long answer for it, but your question is absolutely right. So that stuff goes with it. On the question of salience, look, bluntly, there is a sort of political establishment that never talks about these issues. They're not articulated in any national newspaper. Uh, there are no really leading politicians who are talking about these things. So they people say, well, people aren't interested. Well, in a sense, the people are saying no one's interested, but the people have most interest in keeping things the way they are. <laughs> and sometimes the small CR party can be a little bit conservative. Mm -hmm. well, do we have that reform because we are so wedded to the idea of it must be winner takes all, even if you think a winner somebody else. And we <laughs> have a chance to, 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 to do it. You know, um, we, we rather like this system in Westminster because we fought a long time to get here. You know, I was one of those. So what's all this, do we really want to empower those mayors? You know, do we really? Do the civil servants really believe that anybody in Manchester could have a better idea about how to solve the Manchester problem than somebody in Whitehall to get people in from Oxford? You know, I, I'm afraid I, I worked that system for a long time. All of those attitudes are there. So we, we in a sense, need to get our own party of service on board. Now, there is now the new Commission on the Future of the UK, which Gordon Brown is chairing. It's, it's not clear publicly yet what the methodology of that is going to be, and different versions of it have talked about opening it up to a wider audience and sometimes it feels more like a party discussion and sometimes it feels more like a discussion of some people within the party. <coughs> now I think we should push that to be as open and wide as, as possible as you wrote on the Labour list about it about a year ago when it was first. You know, we would be far better to invite other political parties, churches, um, unions who are not affiliated to the Labour Party, uh, everybody into, into, in, into that debate. So we actually have a national debate and we make it clear we're prepared to be we're prepared to be radical about what we do. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, next round of questions. So I'll take the person there just at the perfect, um, the here, and I will take the front as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm an English person living in Scotland at the moment, and I've only really felt um, in in touch with my Englishness since moving there as a response to anti-English sentiment. <laughs> and it feels like you're allowed to be proud to be Scottish and proud to be Welsh, 
but not really proud to be English. Um, and I wonder how do we um, like fight that? And is it possible under a Conservative government? Hi. Um, maybe it's covered by the previous question a little bit, but I guess when I think of England and Englishness, it's a bit of a poisonous word in the, in the way I see it. Um, how do we make the, how do we rebrand the English, the word English and English flag um, less like hooligans and more like uh, hobbits and Shakespeare? And <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. I was just wondering on some of um, John's ideas, which I think are, are really um, inspiring, just how do we over, overcome the practical obstacles um, that face us in terms of electoral reform? Is, uh, it sounds really positive, but after just suffering the loss we have, uh, it's quite easy to spin that into a story of uh, Labour trying to change the rules in order to be able to get into power. The same with the ministers in uh, bringing the ministers into government from other parties. Of course, anything that's going to strengthen the union is not going to be in incredibly um, exciting to an SNP minister, uh, and they can of course uh, obstruct that and refuse. How there are sort of practical obstructions to, to embrace Englishness. Excuse me, Englishness that have consequences for engaging with Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, that might have uh, problems, how do we overcome them? Thank you. Thank you. Some really interesting questions there around the perceived toxicity of the English brand. Um, can I come to you, please? Yeah. But, but firstly, 80% of people who live in England say they are strongly English, and 60% are proud to be English, and about 20% are uh, ambivalent about it, so it doesn't matter to them, but they are strongly English. So the view that being English represents a toxic brand is usually held by people with all due respect who are not English. They're the minority. Now, one of the problems is those people are particularly influential in the media and sometimes in politics as well. So the problem we have is actually not that Englishness is toxic or racist or whatever, but it is projected as that. And we need to challenge that wherever we hear it. Say, well, look, if it was really that bad, you wouldn't have 80% of people in the country saying they're strongly English, and so many people being proud to be English. The second thing about it is that one of the things that's blinded us to is the way that Englishness is changing. So just as with Britishness, the number of people who think that to be English you have to be white halved to one in ten in the years either side of Brexit. We were all told that Brexit was an absolute result of xenophobic Englishness, but actually Englishness was becoming more inclusive. And one of the things that's interesting is some with Gareth Southgate's football team, two things. One is the number of Scots who said to me, oh, I quite like that sort of Englishness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if the only Englishness you've seen is sort of Boris Johnson, you can sort of see that possibly that's a limited <laughs> for, for the English as a people. Uh, but the other thing about the, the Gareth Southgate stuff was in a sense the sense of surprise there was, often on the liberal left, those of the Guardian asked were saying, oh, I didn't know about this. But that Englishness has been growing out there in the towns and cities and streets of England over the last 15 or 20 years. You know, a new Englishness has been taking place because a new England has been taking place because we've had all of these democratic change, demographic changes. One of the things we need to work on as a party mm. is that, and, and in civic organisations, is you see that Englishness in football, to some extent you see it in other sports, you don't see it in the cultural life, you don't see England represented. The Guardian last year famously in a report about racist violence had a cartoon of a white skinhead with a, with a St George Cross t-shirt. So the Guardian was basically saying, racist attacks are about English people. Now there was absolutely no justification and nothing in the report that actually said that at all. So one of the things that really interests me at the moment, and I think if we can we go away and do this, how do we represent these things in an inclusive way? And a couple of years ago, I had a student look at council websites where they're promoting St George's Day events. I have to say, quite a lot of councils, including Labour councils, have events for St George's Day that only show white people on them. That's making worse rather than better. So, you know, where we are in power, where we can run community events, we can do a great deal to make sure that Englishness is also always associated with the England we all now live in, not the England past that I was born into quite a long time ago. Thank you, John. And uh, can I just say I'm very proud of having my St George's flag outside the window. Gavin, over to you. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree almost entirely with everything we just heard. Um, it seems to me, and it seems to me when I was writing the book, that all nationalisms uh, can either be, there's, there's, Ernest Gell has written about this, that, that essentially they can be, they can be outward looking, uh, they can be positive. I, I tend to think of that as patriotism. For me, patriotism is what's good about us, what's good about England. And it is, you know, that the three biggest movie franchises in Hollywood are based on writers in English, including Tolkien and Ian Fleming and, and, and Rowling. It is about uh, all the good things of this country. It is, about, it is about the culture here. It is about the fact that language has conquered the world, you know, that English is the reserved language of the world, that like, like the dollar is the reserved currency. It is about the England football team. Um, as a Scotsman, I can, I can say it. And the, the toxic element that you find in, in, in Scotland the SNP, to be fair to them, I'm not, I'm not a member, they have tried to crack down on it because they know it's very, very bad for Scotland's image as an outward-looking country and as a, as they would like to see it, similar to Ireland and Scandinavia. And it is interesting that in terms of migration, for example, we have seen in the south side of Glasgow, we have seen protesters lying under um, home office, brackets, English home office, as, as seen in Glasgow, uh, uh, a truck trying to throw people out who come from, from South Asia. And this was their neighbours who lay under it. So it is an attitude to uh, refugees, for example. Uh, I was born in Glasgow. Glaswegians call themselves Ouija's. And there are lots of signs up in Glasgow saying uh, there are refugees welcome because you're one of us. So to go to John's point, that is exactly what it seems to me is, is necessary in England, is to reflect the England that we see in the England football team or we see in this room or you see in any in, in, in most of the streets of most of our big cities. And the toxic element will fade. Uh, and it's quite right that people should be embarrassed about some, a, a small section of a crowd that boos the Danish national anthem. I mean, but we're all, but English people are most embarrassed by that because that is not English. Uh, that is not England, I should say. Uh, and the, the, the other point about electoral reform is very, very difficult because I agree with the speaker over there that partly uh, uh, people think it, it's quite boring. But when you say we're in the state we're in because we don't have it, and you take it back to them, and you in Birmingham, for example, don't have enough say in what's happening in Birmingham, and you should have more, when you take it back to those issues, that's where at least you can start the conversation, it seems to me. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Gavin. Um, okay, I'm going to take this as the final round of questions. If everyone could just keep it brief, you've been brilliant at doing that. I'm going to take the gentleman at the back, you've had your hand up for a while. I'll take the gentleman there, and I'll take the gentleman at the front. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, John and Gavin, um, you've given us a huge amount to uh, think about. Um, um, my question, John, is, uh, if you might imagine, uh, directed at you. Uh, you've, you've, you've given us a great trajectory, and you've also said about devolution uh, and Englishness expansion um, are, are not uh, opposed to each other. But in practical terms, um, you and I were on the front bench at the time when we tried to bring in alternative vote. Uh, you, you know what happened in the Northeast. Um, and my question is um, to what extent does, does all the cultural stuff that you're talking about? have a resonance in economic terms um, and job terms in both combined authorities and mayors and outside of that. And how do you see what all the things you've talked about today coinciding with that? Because, and indeed taking, you talked about towns, taking seaside and communities, uh, rural communities. Um, how does all that mesh itself underneath uh, the English banner uh, to make actually the sort of things you're talking about today possible in the short term before we get to Labour government. Gentlemen with the green shirts. Just to back. Thank you. Uh, my question is, how does the Labour Party reclaim Englishness, how does the Labour Party advocate and champion the positive aspects of Englishness when so many of our members would find that anathema to uh, our, um, uh, our position as a party and our values and would seek to um, vote against that if we were to bring something like that forward right here at conference? 
and it's just here at the front piece. <laughs> so it is a very, it's on its way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, a very quick comment that I think I just wanted to make that Scotland's no less racist than England and stuff. I think we need to make that point as well. As like, on the positive side, but equally, actually, there's been a lot of studies done on this, and um, it's statistically, we're exactly the same on both sides. And yeah. Openness, but also a kind of progressive um, thing. So I think that's also something, something to bear in mind in, in, in these conversations. So like, how do the politics diverge? Um, and why. And I think in Scotland we've had basically the SNP came in to be able to pick up pe from people's feelings of neither of the parties actually representing them and that politics was, that the politicians were the issue. And now what's happening up in Scotland where I am is that the SNP are becoming the party of the middle classes when they had the working class vote to begin with and that's falling off. So there's something about power, and I think that it's going to come to roost up in Scotland as well. Like when it's it's not a paradise. So how does Labour work to show working class people that they're going to give power back to them? I think that's the massive question, and especially after they have voted for Brexit, it hasn't happened. Whether you're for, I'm mean, not for Brexit, Brexit, and I've always I was for Brexit. <laughs> Conversation on the train with some randoms, and they're like, "You said breakfast." Um, so when that wasn't listened to, you know, and so how does Labour say, and how is it going to show that it's going to give power back to people in England, also in Scotland, also in Wales, um, and also re-engage with its working class voters? In Thank you. And you know, I'm sure there's lots of disagreement around Brexit, but there certainly isn't around breakfast, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come to Gavin first. Yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I'll be very brief. I agree with you totally. Scotland is no less uh, racist than England. That's abs absolutely uh, not the case. Um, uh, although I would say one thing, uh, that neither the Irish government and the Irish Republic nor the Scottish government has ever declared effectively a hostile environment towards mm -hmm. people migrating to a country and gone around with vans telling people to go home. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, a sign of public, in my view, racism, which is, is not been reflected uh, uh, elsewhere in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, secondly, on uh, electoral reform, I mean, look, uh, I think there are only three countries in Europe that have a first-past-the-post system. And those are Belarus, England, and the Vatican. Now, I'm nothing against the Pope, but this is a very strange way of a 21st century information age democracy to be tied to the era of the horse and car. And if you just say that to people, they go, what? Does nobody else have it? They don't. So uh, you could start there. In terms of a, a, a positive version of Englishness, yeah, exactly. Uh, reaffirm what is positive about this country. Reaffirm what we like about us, not what we don't like about them. That seems to me to be the answer. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you for keeping me very brief. A lot of people will do that, Chair. Uh, John, over to you. No pressure. <laughs> Earlier question about these things. Look, the thing about PR, it, it, it works if we as a party, and this is where I think we should go, actually say we're committed to pluralist politics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you make it look like we can't win, therefore you've got to stick these votes together because that's the only way to stop it. That's not a principal position. Saying that we actually believe that any powers that Andy Burden gets, Andy Street should get, that's pluralist politics. Mm -hmm. It's not about saying we're going to reward our friends if we're going to talk about a different way of governing this country. So I think it's that line of argument. The second point really, um, how do we do this before there's a Labour government? Well, I think it, that, that's, well, that's extending that same sort of argument. What, what we do need to make sure is that devolution isn't the speech that the leader gives at LGA Labour Group conference, right? And then possibly a paragraph at the national conference, but it doesn't come into the other speeches. So we do need to be sort of engaging with our front bench people and so that every policy you talk about, you need to be talking about which bits of that need to be devolved at local level, which bits can't be solved by a white school policy and will need to change at local level. That's a different way of thinking, but I think we can sort of badger away through our policy mechanisms and so on and do that. I hope Lucy Powell took a brilliant policy trail yesterday about not letting developers build stuff and sell them overseas, but that's an England-only policy. Lucy's policy brief does not apply outside England. 
So let's say that's an England policy. Let's say to party members, you have to talk about England because England's policy is not the same as Wales and Scotland. If you want to change the Scotland policy in Scotland, you've got to get elected in Scotland, right, to the Scottish, uh, Scottish Parliament or to the Welsh Senate in those countries. So make it clear, because the case for doing stuff about England is as much about civic democracy the right to have a decent government that's properly elected and accountable. Yes, it appeals to people with a particular English sense of identity, and that's where I started my talk. But ultimately, the case for democratic England is we want to live in a civic democracy. And that applies to somebody who's British, not English, every bit as much as English, not British. Um, uh, the, the, just like that last point about, yes, the tracks, the tracks towards inclusivity have been different in the different nations. The Scottish project was always quite elite led right back from the early days of devolution and independence discussions, because you had to ask the question, who's going to be Scottish for these purposes? And it became the only possible conclusion who has ever been lived in Scotland. British multiculturalism, oh, most people in England don't realise this, British multiculturalism never happened outside England. It was a purely English project, but it applied to British identity within England. Welsh progress towards inclusivity was a different history, because there are different, his, uh, different communities and histories there. One of the issues about England is England has never been promoted actively as an inclusive identity by either the state or by civic society. The surprise about Englishness is not that it's not yet fully inclusive, but it's become as inclusive as it has, despite nobody actually making any efforts to make that happen. <laughs> the English people are sort of sorting it out for themselves. And I think one of the, for the party comrades, what we've got to say to them is both that civic and democratic case. There is a place called England, it has its own policy, we should be worried about how it operates, and a lot of that power should be devolved. But secondly, get people to look around them and say, actually, there is an English identity taking place. You don't have to have these prejudicial fears about what Englishness means. So, you know, catch up with what's happening and help it go further. Thank you, John. <laughs> that concludes our event this afternoon. Thank you very much to both our panellists. They were brilliant. Thank you to you for being a great audience. And thank you to SME for Labour for putting on this event um, on a really important issue.